Hey, good morning, Knoxville. I hope you're having a great morning so far. It is gorgeous outside. We are in for maybe the best weather week of the fall, so I hope you're excited about that. I hope you're going to get out and, and do some fun things. 10-day calendar went up this morning, and there are over 150 options for you in downtown Knoxville in the next 10 days. It's pretty stunning, and it'll wear you out, and it says a lot about where we've, where we've gotten to at this point. This past week on InsideOfKnoxville.com, we talked about uh, several things. I had a guest uh, writer, Oren Yarbrough, who did a great, great job, generated a lot of conversation about the AT&T building, which is certainly um, a candidate for the ugliest building in the city. And it's right next to the interstate, so everybody who travels through Knoxville gets to see the AT&T building that has no windows and sheer walls, and it's gray with lots of stuff on top. So his point was like a twofold. The first day he looked at the history of the building. How did it get to be that way? And it turns out it got to be that way over time. And originally the building was quite an attractive uh, building and it's still there, uh, this, the part of it that was original. And it's been added to over the years and has become probably, we would all agree, I think, less attractive as it has gone. The next day he looked at possible solutions for that. And uh, Chattanooga has done a great great work with a mural system on one on one of their buildings that are very that's very similar and uh, so he made suggestions that we might might try that so a lot of people I think were energized by those articles and if you didn't see those go back and check those out we also talked about the Legacy Housing Foundation and uh, the important work that's being done there it's a new foundation in the last recent months and it's uh, designed to help people who are struggling with housing and struggling with making ends meet to have a little bit better life, to get a little leg up. So that's a good one too to support and uh, look into. We looked at uh, the Tennessee Archive of Moving Images and Sound and the good work that they're doing. They're having a home movie night coming up soon and that'll be on Market Square and then also in the Tennessee East Tennessee uh, Historical Center there on Gay Street. So check that out this coming weekend. That's on the calendar as well. And then uh, I ended the week talking about just a really, really cool event that I stumbled into. Um, I was in New York City most of the week. It was great. Those of you who travel to the city and return know that it's there's, there's a re-entry moment where you're thinking, where are the buildings? <laughs> Wait a minute, I've lost my way. And uh, so I was kind of having that moment. It was Thursday afternoon, and uh, Urban Boy was hanging out with me. He's two years old, and he wanted to go for a walk in the city. So we went for a walk in the city, went through Market Square, stumbled into a sound check, and he went crazy. He was, like, dancing and having a great time. And I realized that the um, San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus and the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir have been held over a few hours and they were going to do a one hour show on Market Square on Thursday night. So we went to that at Urban Boy's insistence and what a blast. What a great, great re-entry into our fabulous city. I was able to walk two blocks from my house and hear these two groups from the other side of the country just blasting it out and having a, a great celebration on Market Square. Dancing, the mayor was there, introduced them, stood up front and danced the whole time. And it was just a, it was a good time to be in Knoxville and to be a Knox, Knoxville citizen. So lots of good things happened this week. We covered those on the blog. We're going to shift gears here pretty quickly. We're going to we have a couple of guests with me this morning that, um, you know, it's really important that everybody start tuning in. Early voting starts this week uh, on Wednesday. And so we're going to need to really tune in to our city council races and start uh, start making what's going to happen in our city next happen because we're going to have five new pre people on city council it's going to be an entirely different city council so it's important that we have information about that this morning we're going to focus on district two we have wayne christensen and andrew roberto and we're going to talk about the issues related to their district but also the whole city because everybody gets to vote in every district if you didn't know that and it's really important that you do so so we'll be right back with them in just a few minutes and we'll look at some of the issues the city is facing very excited to have you to uh, district 2 uh, like like other districts actually but it's it's it's, it's odd in its own way it starts in Sequoia Hills it kind of goes through it's like Sutherland is also right and then it goes out to West Hills and then there are all these dots mm -hmm. all these little tiny yellow dots which I guess represent annexation through through the year so it's an odd odd district in that way I mean to talk about it in a unified sense it, it's kind of difficult because it's a lot of different kinds of areas I, I would really 
let's let's start off with just a, cu a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> but let's start off with your backgrounds. Tell tell people, you know, kind of where you're coming from, why you decided to to run, you know, what what kinds of contributions you've made to the city before this, and and um, and what what brings you to this point generally. And I'm going to repeat this because we're also on the radio. I'm going to start with Wayne in this this case. We'll go back and forth on that. Wayne, tell us why you're here. And well, how, you, how you got to be here? I'm Wayne Christensen, and I'm running for city council in West Knoxville, which actually runs from the Ag Campus all the way to Turkey Creek, but not all of that. And then there's a bunch of finger annexations, as you as you pointed out. So it is really spread out. Um, I came to Knoxville 35 years ago after serving as an officer in the Navy. Um, my first job here was working for Whittle Communications on the editorial side. I worked there for a decade. The next two decades, uh, I worked for Knox Youth Sports, a youth sports program at Lakeshore Park that tried to grow kids up through team sports, kids age 3 to 13. Um, I, we, did about, we had about 2,000 kids per year. Um, so I've had two great careers here. Uh, my wife's had a graphic design career here for 30 years. My son was raised in the schools and the churches and the neighborhoods here, now has four kids of his own, and I'm simply grateful for everything that the city has done for me. And so I want to go to work for the city that has given me and my family so much uh, to make it just a little bit better place, even though it's a terrific place uh, already. Very good. Andrew? Well, Alan, thanks a lot for having me on this morning. Um, my name is Andrew Roberto. I'm running for city council in District 2. Um, I've lived in Knoxville my whole life. I went through our public schools here. Uh, I graduated from UT, so it's always great to be back on campus. Um, was fortunate to uh, be able to go to UT Law School here and uh, now have a small business here, my small law firm that I have here. Um, I've really been um, uh, very fortunate in the upbringing that I had here in Knoxville and all the opportunities that, that I've had. Um, I have two daughters. Uh, a 14 year old and a 15 year old and I really want to make sure that they both have uh, the access to the same opportunities uh, that I had when I was growing up and I really want that to be true for all of us because I think if it's true for one of us it's going to be true for the, the vast majority of us and that's really where we want to be I want to make sure that Knoxville continues to grow in a smart way that we continue to be a place where you can both have good economic opportunity but also a great place to raise a family so that's why I'm running in this race. I want to make sure we all have that access to opportunity. With regard to how did I get here, which I think is the first part of your question, uh, I've served in the community in a number of different ways. Um, I'm the board chair for the Salvation Army, been on the board since 2012. Uh, I'm on the Stratoma board. I was on the executive committee that brought the Medal of Honor Convention here to town, uh, and just that was just a phenomenal uh, uh, event and, and way to showcase what, what Knoxville is all about. Um, I also served as a Knox County Election Commissioner, and I really am excited about what's happening in Knoxville. I think we're at a pivotal point, and I think if we can inject some energy right now, I think we can really see some really positive things happen with regard to uh, quality of life and economic opportunity here in Knoxville. Very good. We're going to uh, stick with you since I said I would go with you for the next question first. Um, so it is an odd district. Uh, there are lots of great things happening in that district just as much as every other district, but there are issues also in every yeah. district. What, what do you see as some of the, the pivotal issues right now facing your district? Well, you know, I think that it's, it's very difficult to identify issues that are specific to districts versus citywide, mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll try to identify a few that I hear when I go to the doors. Uh, in District 2, one of the things I heard the most about was wanting to make sure they had an accessible uh, uh, representative on uh, council, that they felt like they could pick up the phone and call their council person with a concern. And so what we demonstrated during the, the primary was that we are accessible because we tried to get out and talk to as many voters as possible. So during the primary, we made attempts at knocking on over 3,000 doors made countless phone calls. I, I can't even think of all the different events we went to to be accessible and to communicate that, that I want to hear from you. 
I've also given out my cell phone number, I can't tell you how many times, to, to, to different voters to say, hey, you know, I want to hear from you if you're having an issue. Now we've moved into the general election where we're doing the exact same thing. Um, you know, I was in North Knoxville uh, yesterday. I was in South Knoxville earlier in the week. So we're just moving around the city and, and, and wanting to hear from folks about what their issues are. Specifically, one issue that I hear a lot about in District 2, but I also heard about it yesterday in North Knoxville, was, were sidewalks. And folks want to have a more walkable, more accessible community where they can move around. And, 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 and I, I totally appreciate that, and, and I, I see that as something in a vision for what Knoxville will look like moving forward. You know, right now we have a reactive system when it comes to sidewalks, which means that if you're having an issue, you pick up the phone and you complain about it, and then you go on a list. And that, that doesn't really get anywhere, and we've seen that there's been little momentum in moving forward on that. So I propose that we do a proactive system which means that we look at the totality of the city, we identify areas where it makes sense to, to, to go ahead and, and start working on sidewalks, and then we phase those in over time so we can actually start moving the ball. Okay, and I, I think I, I've read enough about each of you that I think there's really gonna be some overlap here. So if you would, Wayne, tell us uh, you know, what you identify as major issues and you can respond to any of the, the, the ones that he raised because I think there is some overlap. From 25,000 feet, my campaign is about continuing the solid growth that Knoxville has experienced over the last perhaps eight years, and, uh, but not at the expense of quality of life. So coming down from that height and just looking at the second district, there's no one overriding issue that I see any more than there's no one overriding issue for the entire city. Uh, there are several issues in uh, in West Knoxville. One of them is the recode effort, which I am solidly behind. It'll take place over the next 12 months. And what it'll allow is folks um, who are living in homes that uh, the kids have moved out uh, and the houses are too big, but there's no place to go to live in a condominium, say for example, in the Bearden area. And over the course of time, I know that we'll change that uh, so that uh, there will be five-story buildings, for example, with retail on the first floor and condominiums or apartments and possibly even affordable housing in the upper floors. I've talked to two developers already and they're ready to go on those projects uh, because it's a, it's a wonderful evolution uh, for not only the Bearden area, but it can be applied to Magnolia, Chapman Highway, uh, Broadway, and other areas as well. So that's one issue. Another issue um, is opioid abuse. There are things that city council can actually do uh, to help combat that problem. We all have a role, whether it's an individual or it's the city council or it's a state government or the federal government. The sidewalk issue is a uh, hot one in particular neighborhoods in West Knoxville, especially West Hills. Uh, Sheffield Road, for example, has been trying to, uh, the folks there have been trying to get a sidewalk for years and years and years. Um, that's not the only part of town uh, that needs sidewalk help. Uh, the city currently has a plan to repave 40 miles of roads per year. So that proceeds uh, in a very organized way. The city has proposed a greenway plan that goes out 15 years, but they don't have a sidewalk plan. So what I proposed is that we repair or build sidewalks, uh, three miles of sidewalks in each of the six districts, 18 miles per year. Now, if we're building uh, sidewalks, they're $1,000 a foot. If we're repairing them, they're $57 a foot. So it would be up to engineering to uh, go with the budget that they are given and make sure they uh, stay within the budget. But I propose uh, vastly increasing the budget. So that's a, that's a very big issue um, that I have a specific proposal on. Well, I, I'm curious. Uh, you both mentioned sidewalks, and, and I think they're really important. Um, 
we talk about any kind of smart growth, that's what, what typically one of the things that gets talked about a lot in terms of health for a community and that, that sort of thing is very important. I have two questions about it, and I'll, I'll let you start, even though you just finished talking. Then we'll keep going back and forth that way if, we, if I can keep track of it. Um, but two, th two things come to my mind. One is uh, it is very expensive, and you mentioned that, and you, you, you said, well, engineering needs to stay in their budget. Well, if we're going to increase our expenditures on sidewalks tremendously, which I think your plan would do, the money has to come from somewhere. How are we going to how are we going to fund that? That's one question. The other question is your district uh, is sort of uh, tracked by Kingston Pike. Kingston Pike is the least walkable, most scary place to be in anything other than a car. And in some cases, it's scary in a car. But but if you're out of a car, it's not friendly. Uh, if you go all the way out uh, Kingston Pike, um, do you? support trying to make Kingston Pike more pedestrian and, and bicycle friendly or do you just feel like well that's just that's just a car centered part of who we are and that's been built and that's the way that's that's going to stay so how are you going to pay for it and and what do you think about Kingston Pike what do we do there well paying for it uh, is really a matter of balancing repair with uh, new uh, that is step one, but I also think that the mayor and the council were on the right course when they upped the budget, and I don't have the exact numbers, but they increased the budget substantially um, this past budget year. I would certainly push for more money in it, but I also see focusing on repair every bit as much as focusing on new sidewalks because um, it's simply too expensive to do all the sidewalks that we would like to do. We'd, we'd bankrupt the city. I did the calculation. It would be something on the order of $200 million, and that's untenable. Kingston Pike is a very problematic uh, street. Folks speed on it um, through Bearden, for example, and then they get into car accidents. And then the cars end up in the yards of folks who live there and wreck their bushes. So working on the speeding is one part of making Kingston Pike better. It's also a state road and so if, if it's going to be dealt with and thankfully the state has repaved a good bit of it of late so at least it's a good road to drive on. Um, I dare say from what I'm told from folks in government that it will take who knows how many years to deal with Kingston Pike. That's not to say that individual businesses couldn't um, improve landscaping uh, around uh, their parking lots, um, some uh, furniture stores, some banks, uh, some funeral homes have done just such a thing and it really uh, looks great compared to the big areas um, that haven't, the big buildings that haven't. So I would uh, try to encourage businesses to do that sort of thing and perhaps City Council has a role in funding um, something along those lines. Okay. Andrew? Yeah, well, let's, let's first dig into why uh, sidewalks are a good idea. Okay. Um, you know, obviously there's a health uh, aspect that you can look at because, you know, people are moving around and, and encouraged to, to walk around in their community. So there, obviously there's that aspect of it. But then there's also an aspect of increased property values because it's been shown to me that uh, when you have a sidewalk out in front of the house and you've got a more walkable, accessible community, that the, your property values go up. So it's helpful for the, the, the homeowner there. There's also a safety benefit too, because if you're, if you're in a community where people are moving around or walking around in your community, crime level goes down. So, you know, there's a lot of really good reasons for, for, for sidewalks. You know, the other one that just comes to mind is, you know, you might be able to, depending on where you are, walk to you know, a business or your friend's house that you were going to go to and not drive. And so there's obviously a pollution aspect of it that you can look at too. So your question specifically was, well, how do we pay for it? And that's a great question. Okay. So what we have to look at is that the single largest uh, uh, revenue source for the city is growing at about 1%. Okay. We can do better than that. I think we have to do better than that so that we can continue to improve the quality of life in Knoxville that I've seen by living here 
my entire life. You know, we've we've really seen, and you talked about it in your intro about you know, hey, look at all these things that are going on downtown. Uh, well, you know, 30 years ago that may not have been going on. There were literal tumbleweeds downtown, right? So we've really moved the ball a lot, and I'm excited about where we're going. But what we've got to make sure we do is grow the economy and grow it in a smart way. And I think we've touched on the recode as one of those catalysts we can use to grow the economy. The second issue you talked about was Kingston Pike. Okay, so how do we deal with having a more walkable area when you're looking at something as busy uh, as, as Kingston Pike, which you very aptly uh, uh, brought up. So I'm in support of what's called the Bearden Urban Village Plan. And that takes a section of that area and it expands greenways, it expands sidewalk areas, it builds in mixed use, and it makes for a more walkable area right there. And I think if we start building in some of these uh, areas along areas that make sense for more high density use, we can start to see that catalyst spread out from there and you're going to see more and more impact. It's not something that would happen overnight, but I think it starts us down the path of having a more walkable, accessible community. Very good. It, it's, a, it's a struggle when you talk about uh, particular parts of Kingston Pike. You know, certainly Bearden is one of those areas that might lend itself a little more to Hamburg and that mm-hmm. area to, to that sort of thing. Um, some of the other areas are, are, are going to be even more difficult. Uh, actually, um, the other night, Bill Lyons posted a, a little story he wrote on Facebook about uh, he was at a business and had to wait on his car for a couple hours out west, and so he walked yep. mm-hmm. a mile or two miles or something uh, ridiculous down Kingston Pike, and he, he was just talking about how, how treacherous <laughs> it is. And, and uh, the people that I feel the most for are the people who don't have cars. I see them get off at a bus stop, and then they need to walk this way or that way on that that. Uh, that road and it's difficult you know we just saw uh, with Cumberland you talk about reducing speed uh, Wayne we just talked uh, just saw a massive work done on Cumberland Avenue strip to make it not only more attractive but just safer it's easier to cross now I, I, I walk a lot personally and it's it's a lot easier feels safer to cross there's an island in the middle the, the roads are more narrow narrow roads have been shown to slow traffic I mean that's one of the things talking about people speeding on Kingston Pike but one way to combat that would be to just narrow those roads just briefly because we've got so many other issues to get onto but I I would love to hear each of you respond uh, to to that would you be in favor of at least in some sections of Kingston Pike narrowing, narrowing it to add sidewalks or narrowing it to add an island in the middle or doing something similar to what was done on Cumberland and uh, we'll start with Andrew. Well, I think the answer to that is really in the, the my previous answer. You know, the Bearden Urban Village Plan I think is a great place to start. Um, I don't know that having, you know, if you have a if you have sidewalk on Kingston Pike, you may end up in the same situation you were talking about earlier, where you know it's not somewhere you're going to want to walk. Mm-hmm. Um, so we need to build that in, and I think we can use the recode to help build that in. Right. <coughs> Wayne. Uh, the Cumberland project was, if I've got my numbers right, about an $18 million project. Uh, and the return uh, in terms of private investment is something on the order of $160 million. If that model could be repeated at different sections of Kingston Pike, it would make it a whole lot easier to justify narrowing and landscaping. Um, so. Uh, the, the numbers would, would be very tough to do that sort of thing. I think it's worth looking at, not just Bearden, but all the way out to uh, West Town Mall and past. Mm-hmm. Well, West Town Mall is one of those most treacherous places. I mean, if you if you want to leave West Town Mall on foot and go anywhere, it. it's, it's scary. I, I've, I've done it. it it's scary. Um, all right, let's, let's shift a little bit and let's talk about citywide issues. We're already kind of spilling over into that. There's so many issues that will face city council uh, that are facing them now. We'll face them coming up. Environmental sustainability, we have walkability, multimodal transportation, fair and affordable housing, outside investment is starting to come in and that, that can be a great thing and can also be sort of treacherous. Supporting small businesses, investing in local infrastructure, uh, public amenities, lots of others. Which, which of these issues would each of you feel um, inclined to prioritize what, what do you think it's like if there's something or, or a couple of things that we just have to get right next 
what would that be and what do you, where do you stand on those issues and we'll, we'll start with Wayne on this one. Cops and jobs. Cops and jobs. Two, two short words. Uh, there's a role for city council to play in increasing the number of construction trades folks in town. The uh, builders that I talk to, the commercial builders that I talk to, say that our workforce is about 50% of what it should be uh, in order to maintain um, all the projects that are going on here. Um, I talked to uh, somebody in Island Home the other day who said KUB came through and put a, uh, something down the alley uh, and they had um, uh, workers from out of state. I know these big companies are bringing in Alabama crews and Georgia crews. Mm -hmm. So if we had an internship program for kids not going to college that was a combination of efforts from uh, city council and all these big uh, companies that could lead to uh, these young kids getting certified in a trade after a certain amount of time and um, they would end up with terrific jobs. I've got some plans for uh, uh, folks graduating from UT, uh, undergraduate or graduate programs also, um, but let me su switch to the cops part right now. Um, I've talked to neighbors in three different areas, Oakwood Lincoln Park, uh, Sutherland Avenue, uh, and on Magnolia. And they have all reported um, significant difficulties in getting a police uh, squad car to respond to a problem. On uh, Sutherland or on Magnolia on any given night, there might be two squad cars um, assigned to serve a very, very large area. Uh, in Oakwood Lincoln Park, there was a, an assault going on and a young woman uh, was dealing with it and three of their neighbors, her neighbors, called the police and they didn't show up for 20 minutes. We don't have enough police. We don't have enough academies. Our police force is down. They're overworked. And uh, the first order of business for a city is to make sure it's a safe place for its citizens. So. That absolutely has to be addressed. We train them so well, they get hired away, not only to regional police departments, but we just lost an Hispanic officer to the Secret Service. Um, so that's how good our cops are. We're just not taking care of them enough. Okay, so jobs and cops. What, 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 what do you think, Andrew? So, you know, again, you know, citywide, I think just like in the district, we're looking at very similar, similar issues that I've heard all over, but you know, we, we have, there's not one overarching one that we need to deal with, but several that we need to move on at the same time. So the first one is economic growth. So we've got to make sure we maintain good job opportunity here in Knoxville. Knoxville's always had a, uh, a, a been a great place to, you know, find a career, find a job, but also to raise a family. So we've got to make sure we maintain that balance. Now, if you think about Knoxville, um, you know, if you were going to build a community that was, was you know, had an economic engine that could really move, it would be this community. You've got people that live here that are ingenuitive, that are creative, that want to, you know, uh, be entrepreneurs and start businesses. And we've seen lots of examples of, of that happening, right? And, and we can think of th those individuals themselves. Then you'd have a great place with natural resources, which we have, you know, we have those things. Then you'd have large economic partners, one of whom we're sitting in right now, right? The University of Tennessee, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, TVA. We can, we can build around all that, leverage what's going on here economically, and really, I think, get our economic engine uh, moving in a, in a really good, robust way. The other thing to think about, too, is, is public safety. Um, you know, we, if, you, if you look at the numbers, Right now, there are 88% of the uh, officers uh, in, you know, serving our community than there were 20 years ago. Now, in that 20 years, what's happened in Knoxville? Have we grown? Uh, yes. You know, are there more, uh, more assignments that we're giving our officers? Do we have greenways now that you know, we didn't have as much of before? Are there other areas where they're having to work on task force? So this has led to a lot of overtime hours for our officers. And so one of the things I've said that we need to address uh, in a public safety uh, realm is to do a review of the size of the police force and make sure we have enough officers to effectively implement um, community policing, which I'm a big advocate of. And what that means is that you have officers 
out of the car, walking around in the community, talking with neighbors, building relationships, figuring out where the issues are, and then and then hopefully you know not having as many issues. 45 seconds, which is virtually impossible for the questions I'm going to ask you. So good luck. <laughs> I wish you both well. Um, start start with you, Wayne. Uh, development. We're have, we're seeing a lot of development in Knoxville, especially downtown, but but all across the city. And um, development can be great. It, it also comes with costs sometimes. Issues like um, outside money is coming in, which is great because that makes allows us to do bigger things than perhaps we've we've been able to do before. Uh, but at the same time, outside investors may not have the long term concern for our city in mind that they that a, a local person might. I can build a building, make a lot of money, and then sell it and leave, and I don't care what happens to it later kind of thing. So uh, there are also perils of development like um, gentrification, which is a buzzword again, and it can mean a lot of different things, but there, there's an issue of displacement of people who live in an area, and that area becomes more valuable, and then they suffer from not having housing and so forth. So there's some, some issues there. What do you see uh, as City Council's role in encouraging the kind of development that we want to have that's going to make our city a healthy, good place for long term? 30 seconds. One of the biggest developers in Knoxville is KCDC. I spent time with Ben Bentley last week and they're a, a rental housing development arm of the city. The city can use them to build projects in areas where there are no projects. TIFs and pilots have been used successfully in the past. I think uh, for downtown projects, uh, downtown is almost out of space in old buildings, but these could, tips and pilots could be used on Magnolia, on Chapman Highway, on Broadway. So there are many things that can be done. So you support tips and Absolutely. so forth. All right. Andrew? Well, so let's talk a little bit about tips and, tips and pilots. Um, you know, at the beginning of that program, you had, uh, you know, uh, about 50 projects. Uh, or the, if you added up all the pro programs, you'd have about 50 projects. They start out at an assessed value of about $50 million. You move on to the end of the projects, the assessed value is half a billion dollars. Now you can imagine how that ripples through our economy, that, that kind of money. Um, that benefits all of us because it's that kind of positive growth. So you know, definitely that, that program has been very successful. Where do we need to concentrate that now? I think you identified correctly that a lot of that's been going on downtown. We need to move that down our corridors and into areas that is more appropriate for high density. With regard to what can city council you know, specifically do to, to ensure that we're getting the development that we want, the kind of smart growth that we want, well, we, we oversee that with design standards and with reasonable um, expectations of those that are building in our community to make sure that we are moving in the direction we want to with a more walkable, accessible community. Well, we're going to wrap up with uh, just a, a general question that you can answer in about 60 seconds or less uh, <laughs> to the best of your ability. Just tell, tell uh, us, and we'll, we'll start with Andrew, so I've been trying to go back and forth. Uh, tell us what would be the reason that somebody should vote for you in this election? What, what do you think distinguishes the two of you, or what do you think recommends your candidacy? And we're going to start with... Andrew. Well, you know, I've served the community in a number of different ways. Um, you know, we talked about some of them already, but uh, I've also handed out uh, bike helmets with the Epilepsy Foundation. I've um, been involved with the Tennessee Veterans Business Association, starting a, a business plan competition for veterans when, when we had uh, lower employment for, uh, for our veterans. So I've, I've gotten involved a lot in the community, and I have a lot uh, of energy. And I really am excited about what's going on in Knoxville, and I'm ready to, to get to work for all of us. You know, if you, you know, one of the things I think you have to identify is just what, what are you doing in the campaign, you know? And, and I've been working really hard to get out and talk to folks all over the city, and I'm ready to, to work for everyone. Very good. All right, Wayne? Uh, I'm a fiscal conservative. I've got a broad background that includes military, a real high-flying business and also full-time community service. I think those um, positions all contributed to a certain set of skills that is unique. Um, I also am retired and so I can work full-time on this job, which is exactly what uh, I plan to do. So 
to all the listeners out there. I'm Wayne Christensen, District 2, which is West Knoxville. I would love your vote. All right. Thank you both for being here. It's been a good conversation. It's gone, I don't know if it feels as fast to you as it does to me, but it feels very, very rapid. So we're going to have to wrap up, uh, but I do appreciate you both coming on. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks for having yeah. us. Thank you. No hour two. No, no, well, there is an hour or two, but it's not mine, so it's going to have to go to somebody else. So we're going to take a break now, and I'll be right back with what's coming up in downtown Knoxville the next week.